this, we'll start with a little bit of a conversation to get things started. And then if you have questions, uh, just drop them in the chat box in the chat window, or really with just this, uh, this uh, group, you can probably just unmute yourself and just ask, um, just go ahead and ask. So um, because we have a, a, a three uh, researchers here, I thought we would start with a sort of general question and then I'll just let the three of you, I'm not sure you're gonna fight it out, but just let just the three of you talk about it. Um, so, so, so it's a fairly general question. Um, and so here's the question. So the question is in light of the, of the COVID pandemic, what are your thoughts about the ethics of data visualization? So we've been having a lot of conversations about who and what and when people should create different types of visualizations, um, whether they have expertise in those uh, areas or not. So I thought that would sort of, and, and seems to kind of line up with a lot of things you've all been working on and writing about. So I thought that would be a general enough. Um, so maybe we'll start with Michael, since Michael, you got in the room first and you're in Madison. So I have a special place in my heart for Madison. So we'll start there. Um, and then, yeah, we can just, we can just chat. So uh, ethics of, ethics of, of data viz, um, and it can be anything you want to talk about, the research side, the production side, the practitioner side, you know, let's just, we'll just chat for a bit. Yeah. So, I mean, to me, I would hope that sort of the sheer amount of misinformation and this kind of obvious danger associated with these COVID-19 visualizations. Um, to me, I'm sort of viewing it as an opportunity to, to, I was trying to find different metaphors for this, but I'm sticking with putting a stake through the heart of the two vampires of visualization um, that I think have kind of stood in the way of rebuilding things on sort of more humane ethical grounds. Um, so these two vampires. Uh, the first is this mistaken belief that our expertise with data in the abstract, like we often, ah, I know what shape this data is in, um, that we think that makes us qualified to just sort of muscle our way into arbitrary fields and start doing analysis without sort of doing any of the work or building any of the collaborations you need to make sure that you're not screwing up. Right, so I'm looking at a lot of this initial stuff that you saw, not just from visualization, but other folks in the tech industry that were like, oh, you know, I'm doing these back of the envelope calculations or, you know, I'm an expert in SEO. So I think I know about virality, right, and, and writing these things. And it's not hard to look at all those things now and think, hey, what's the body count associated with each one of these mistaken things? Um, right, so that's the, that's the first thing is just thinking that our expertise is universal just because we know about data and COVID-19 data is just another kind of data. And the second vampire, right, is that um, visualization design, and I don't know the right word for this either, um, but it's maybe either procedural, right, or puzzle solving, right? Like you look at, ah, okay, I have case data, that's quantitative data on a timestamp, so I know it's a time series, which means I want a line chart, they're done, I'm done with my design. Um, and it's this idea that once we know the shape of the data, we just object choose the objectively right design and then we're finished. Uh, where this data, where the form of the data is pretty simple, it's time series data, geotag data, things like that, but there's all this messiness and uncertainty and incompleteness that we don't have access to, um, which shows that, you know, the inadequacy of visualization to deal with some of these issues, it's more than just choosing the right encoding based on the abstract structure. Yeah, yeah, I mean that's a good yeah. Go ahead. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just. I'm just literally listening to the three of you. So this is just enjoying for me. So go ahead. Um, well, I can jump in after that. I think, I mean, Michael made a few important points um, and I'll just make a few more sort of, um, I mean, I think the expertise thing is very critical here, especially with COVID graphics, like just because you're good with data, you, you don't necessarily have the expertise you need. Um, I've been thinking a lot about a few things that I think are, are sort of functions or um, sort of effects that visualization has that we have to be particularly aware of right now. So. You know, often I think when you visualize something, it implies importance. Um, so if you have, you know, some text information and then you visualize something, um, you know, even if that that thing that you're visualizing, you know, it's sort of, you know, um, not not entirely trustworthy, or you know, there's uncertainty um, related to how much we should trust that. I think simply the act of visualizing information sometimes conveys importance. It's like a salience function. Um, I also think it conveys precision, and I think that aspect of visualization has really been kind of at the forefront, um, at least for me and a lot of maybe other visualization researchers as we look at these COVID graphics. So, you know, um, we might see something like a simulation, um, the model results being visualized, um, you know, predicting things like, you know, hospitalization rates, et cetera. And I think it's very easy to, to look at one of these visualizations, especially if it's maybe interactive and you can play with these different parameters. Um, 
sorry, I have a three-year-old running <laughs> right above me. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, so anyway, it, it can imply completeness when we look, um, you know, especially at some of these COVID graphics where you might have a bunch of parameters that you see go into the model, um, implying that everything's sort of been thought of already. Um, we're also often seeing these sort of distributions of possible outcomes over time. It looks like everything's kind of very comprehensive, like these models are really telling us everything um, in terms of predicting the future. And I think we really have to remain aware that, that visualizations um, you know, can make things seem very complete and precise when in reality, um, there's a lot of uncertainties that we're not even able to visualize. Um, so I think, you know, an, another thing that I've been thinking a lot about is, um, you know, there's this big difference between sort of, you know, um, the sort of small world of your model that conveys like, oh, we can predict this thing with this amount of um, accuracy or this amount of probability. Like we create a, a statistical model and then it, it seems that we can make these precise statements about, you know, there's a greater chance that, that the, the, debt, the hospitalization rate will be this than this. Um, but that's really a false sense of security or, or completeness um, because there's often these, these larger uncertainties as an economist will call it, um, uh, where we simply can't quantify it. So we don't know, for instance, um, how biased the data going into some of these models are. Um, you know, we know that we don't have perfect case counts, et cetera, um, especially in the US, but we can't say how much. So it's hard to quantify how much that's affecting our results. It's hard to know, you know, all of these models that we're seeing, you know, visualized results of are approximations um, to large degrees. Like they're really simplifying a lot of very complex, you know, behavior and, um, you know, ph phenomena in terms of the disease. Um, and the epidemiologists, I think, know that. But, but we often don't see that being expressed to the end users of the visualizations of these results. And I think um, that you know, leads people to think that like, oh yes, it's all quantifiable. I can just look at these results and I can you know, figure out what's the probability that this will happen versus this will happen. And when in reality, um, you know, it all depends on how good our model is in the first place. And so I think you know, there's lots of ways in which when I look at visualizations of COVID, I just get very worried that um, we're not being forthright enough about the uncertainty. Um, and I think we always should visualize uncertainty and make it a big part of how we communicate data. But I think particularly with COVID, because we know, you know, we don't have great data. Um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of these things very early on when we don't yet just have enough data, um, when people are still figuring out the modeling, et cetera. Like, I think it's really um, been more at the, the forefront, at least for me. Um, so, so my big message would be we need to be visualizing uncertainty. Um, and often we can't visualize it, so we at least need to be, be talking about it in text and really leading with a lot of warnings and a lot of disclaimers whenever we make a visualization. Um, and I think there's this interesting question, like, should we even be visualizing data um, that I've been getting asked a lot? And I think Michael, I know, has thoughts on. Um, but I think, you know, if, if you're in doubt of how good the, the, the data is or the model results that you're visualizing are, I think it's pretty dangerous to go ahead and visualize them um, unless you feel confident that you can be incredibly clear about that uncertainty um, and really, you know, make it obvious to the reader. There. Yeah, I, I got well, unmute I myself own. here. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I was I, I was just talking and not even unmuting myself here. Um, so uh, to go a few steps beyond what Jessica and, and also what Michael was saying, the question to me is like, should we even do this? And given the current quality of the data, I would always almost say no because if you look at so case counts are one thing that we know we are way underestimating because we're not testing systematically. We're only testing people who are very severely sick. And so your, your, your sample is extremely biased, such as a little bias. I mean, this is extreme bias. And I just read a thing this morning about how they were testing people in LA and the case count or the, the percentage of people testing, if you're trying to actually sample a population is, is actually way higher. It's like a factor of 20 or 50 higher than you would think. And that's not just a little bit of uncertainty. That that's that's a huge amount. I mean, that's uh, a order of magnitude or two. I mean, that's that's massive. And the same is true for deaths. I mean, there are huge numbers of deaths that are either not reported for whatever reason, or not attributed to COVID because people aren't getting tested. Uh, certainly not after they've died. And if they haven't been tested before they they died, then they never get counted as those. And some people have now been looking at what they call excess deaths. So they're looking at sort of the, the average numbers of deaths 
seasonally adjusted over the last few years, the last few weeks for the last few years, and then try to compare that to the total number of, of deaths that were re reported for these last few weeks and saying, well, there's a gap. There's suddenly this many more people dying, even though uh, then you would expect. And, uh, but that's, those aren't nearly, uh, those are a lot more rather than, than have been reported as, as COVID deaths. And those are likely COVID deaths. So those, those give us much better numbers and they are of course way higher than, than what has been in these sort of official counts. So looking at all this data, I think we're in a, in a really bad position here to, to do anything with that visually because it looks like, oh, this number is higher than that or, or precision. Like there are these county level maps and I'm just, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing at those because it's like, what the hell are you doing county level data when, when the uncertainty is, is a factor of 50? Like how the hell are you going to do anything on a county level? So I just think that the data right now is real garbage and it's useful perhaps to the people who are responding on the ground, but I think reporting that is very problematic. And I, I just really think that people should be a lot less eager to make all these new awesome graphs. I mean, they're, they're very interesting, but, but I think the actual data that's behind those is, is just extremely poor. And, and I think it's very questionable if, if they make much sense as, as communication devices right now. I do feel like though it's, um... What's hard for me is that I see some visualizations like flatten the curve having such a, a strong effect on people's behavior. And I don't know that that's a bad thing. So visualizations can, in a lot of ways, like be these really powerful metaphors. I think what's really hard here is separating out, like, how do I convey the metaphor of something like flatten the curve, which I think really got across this idea that like, this is like, this is what we're trying to optimize for. Like, we just need to understand, you know, that it's like, there's this this limit on, on our, our ability to hospitalize people. Like it was extremely successful at, at getting that across to a lot of people. Um, but it's so hard to draw the line, I think, um, just because when we see something visualized, it seems precise. It's, and I, I found out about flatten the curve that like somebody, the author had just kind of sketched that line as a guess and it wasn't even really model results and that, you know, I think it just like blew me away that although I, I thought it was useful, you know, it convinced me to really take things seriously. At the same time, I realized like I thought that was real. Like I thought some expert had really thought about where to draw that line. And so, so that's why I think it's so important to just like put disclaimers on things and maybe annotate right on the chart. Like if you are going to try to visualize to convey a metaphor, um, to still be super careful about that. Yeah, I don't think I, it's a very... No, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting that some of the most sort of impactful COVID visualizations I've seen have been almost data free, right? Or, or unconnected with case counts on the ground. Like the original flatten the curve thing, it's just a schematic comic, right? Like I think Robert had a post about that recently, right? There's no, there's no data behind it necessarily. It's conveying sort of a general theory, right? And there was also that New York Times graphic a little bit that was the simulitis Right. It was just it was not not related to COVID at all, just bouncing balls and random simulations. Um, that was supposed to show the effects of just abstractly different kinds of things, right? And those had real rhetorical impact. Um, despite not really being data driven, right? So that it shows to me that there's maybe a disc because the actual data on the ground is not necessarily what we want, um, or not good enough to make the kind of rhetorical points we're making, that there's these designs that are very clearly rhetorical, right? That seem to be more impactful. I, I wonder, um, so, so one of, so I think there, you've, Michael, you've already mentioned two. I think there are sort of three visualizations that have captured everybody's attention. You just mentioned two of them. One was the Harry Stevens piece on the simulitis with the, with the thing. And then we have the flat and the curve um, from, I think the economists got it from a CDC report. Um, and then the third one is is um, the John Byrne Murdoch graphs of the Financial Times that are showing the the deaths. And of course, there's a lot of conversation about log scales and about the data itself. And I'm curious, um, given this conversation, your thoughts about that graph in particular, what you've all been mentioning about the the uncertainty and you know, um, I guess annotating the uncertainty and the you know, the, the issues with the data, which he's putting, I mean, John's doing a great job, but, and he puts this all in these Twitter threads, but they're not on the chart itself. And so I wonder 
what you think of of this sort of it, it's it's linked but it's separated and so people grab the chart and fortunately now they're not cropping off the the name of the financial times which people were doing for a while which is ridiculous but i'm just curious about you know this i guess just this, this third most popular graph or this third other popular graph how much the annotation should not just include some specific countries which he's been doing and, and having this title that sort of tells you the story but how much on the graph do you think he should be saying, look, we kind of don't know a lot? Huh, yeah, I mean, the one thing that comes to mind that I like about that graph is that I think he switched at some point to doing like a seven day rolling average, um, which at least takes into account that the, these death counts are noisy. Um, uh, and also using deaths, I think is a better data source than cases. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, I like those charts. That's what I've been looking to. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't have a strong opinion on how he can make them much better. I mean, we could put huge error bars on everything, but I think that would very much change how people use that. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I mean, I think looking to visualizations, like looking to data right now in terms of how, how quickly are things changing? Like what is the rate of growth? Um, more so than the absolute counts is, is what I think, you know, we can put a little more faith into. And I feel like I like the financial times charts because I mean, he's really trying to show, you know, the, how the rates of, of new deaths are changing over time. So um, like, where are we on this exponential curve um, or how exponential is the growth rate right now? And so I think for that, the, the charts make sense. Um, yeah, I'm curious what Michael and Robert think. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have some opinions on those charts. Um, so there was an interesting uh, Twitter thread. Uh, there's this guy at, uh, at University of Washington, Carl uh, Bergstrom, who's a, who's a virologist and, and doing other things. And he points out that how you normalize those curves and where you start those curves from uh, can produce wildly different messages, even for the kinds of charts that that John uh, Bern Murdoch is putting together, right? Which so when I see those Financial Times curves, I'm kind of looking for maybe two or three bits of information. I'm looking, you know, how how is my country doing compared to other countries? Um, I'm looking, you know, how soon is this curve going to flatten or not flatten? Um, and then, you know, what are different countries that have taken different uh, you know, organizational choices to the extent that there's any apples to apples comparisons. Um, how are they? How are they doing versus my country? And the way that you choose to plot those curves, what the what the x-axis is, where the y-axis is, can produce radically different answers to all of those questions. So to me, there's there's a lot of data here, and I like the amount of thinking that is going into generating those charts. But in terms of their actual impact. I'm a little worried that people will walk away with the wrong message based sort of on maybe almost arbitrary design decisions. How so? Well, I think to... <laughs> what are the arbitrary design? Oh, just the way that the axes are scaled. Right, like, like do, I, do I start counting the curve from the, the first death or the first case right. or the 10th death or you know, some right. population metric? Those can produce different orderings of those curves. And so which, which is the real one, we don't know because the data is not great, um, but you know, we have different options. But to, to John's credit also, he has been very good at trying to incorporate all of that as much as he can. So I know that they're working on trying to get those excess deaths counts now. And so I'm not sure if just uh, those are in there yet, but he's been talking about that on Twitter. So I know that he's, he'll be putting those in. So he's been sort of trying to adapt as much as he can while still producing something. So if I'm saying, oh, let's just not do it, that's of course also a problem. But, um, but the other thing of course is that because you're looking at a log scale, you sort of, you can kind of cheat your way out of this because the, the uncertainty would be minuscule on those, on those scales. So whether you can, and if the differences are very large, then, then you can also kind of say, well, South Korea is down here on this log scale and the US is up here. And so then of course that difference is massive, but uh, but the small differences and like day to day, if the curve's going this way or that way, like I keep looking at the New York Times curves, which are look very, which are very similar, and they haven't broken down by state. And when you look during the day, then it's going this way, and then at night it goes like, whoops, no, we actually went up a bit because we didn't actually report all those deaths until like whatever time. So 
you need to really look like step back a bit and say, okay, well, the data has sort of settled down certainly during the day and, and then, and then kind of look at it with like, look back a little bit and see what the trend was the last few days. But, um, yeah. There, so there are ways to help us a little bit, I think, but it's still problematic. So one redesign I saw, or just a different version of a chart to basically show the same thing that Bern Murdoch is trying to show, which maybe some of you have seen, I think it's called something like, how do we beat COVID-19? Or how do we know if we've beaten COVID-19? And what they, they take away basically time, because time is kind of what is making it difficult to compare things in that log scale graph. Um, so rather than like how many days has it been since like the 10th death or whatever, which I think was like what they were doing with Financial Times just to make sure that like if there was a huge difference on how long it took to spread among the first few people that wasn't like drastically impacting how you looked at the chart. But um, a version I've seen is just like removed time entirely so that you just have the new cases log scaled against the total cases log scaled. And so and then it's an animated chart where you basically you see the countries kind of moving along the diagonal, which represents exponential growth. Um, and then as soon as they get off of that growth pattern, like the little line for that country dips down below the diagonal. And so I thought it was a nice way of like really taking like these slope comparisons that we're trying to do. Um, and and making it like basically like if it deviates from this diagonal line, you know, you're no longer in the exponential growth or you've, you've gotten you've reduced that, um, you've gotten away from that trend. Um, and I, one of the things I like, I think it um, relative to the new, the Financial Times is that, um, you know, you're, you're less likely to actually be paying attention to the axes and like trying to really track the data. It's more just about like, do I see this pattern change or not? Um, I can share the link in the chat to that one. Just cause, um, that was actually going to be my, my next question, Jessica. Um, and you've all done research that I think could, could uh, lend at least some of your hypotheses about this, but how do you think um, whatever uh, regular people, whatever that means, I mean, no one on this call is a regular person. So like um, we're talking about, right? <laughs> RJ's shaking his head. I mean, we're definitely not regular people, but how do you think the average financial times or the average Twitter user reads these uh, graphs from, from John since we're on that topic? I mean, is it to most people, do you think it is like the flatten the curve diagram where they're just looking to see where it, it bends back down? Um, are they paying attention to the to the axes? Do they do do you think most people recognize that you know even though it's curved you know even though something may have passed the the peak, it's still a lot of deaths every day and it's still growing. That is a great question. I mean, I know whenever I teach like log transforms on visualizations takes a while <laughs> for people to get it, even if they've had like a stats class, which most of my students have. So I don't have a, a clear answer to that, but I suspect maybe there's a lot of heterogeneity at least that that's, there are some readers who are, um, I think, I mean, one of the things that I felt like right away with seeing the Financial Times and um, how John Byrne Murdoch was kind of arguing for his design over others is that you know, he's really chosen to try to help you make more precise comparisons um, relative to like, you know, if you, we weren't using a log scale, it would look much more extreme. And so I think, I mean, I think he intentionally decided um, to go one way on that trade off to, to really like help us understand like where we're starting to see a fall off in um, deaths. But but I think like there is that risk that now, you know, people look at that and they lose track of how many people have died so far, et cetera. Whereas if you were not log scaling, it would just look, you know, like a crazy, um, just much more extreme depiction. And so I imagine for untrained users that there is a huge difference between those two designs. My, my, my suspicion is that the people consuming those charts are actually maybe not so dissimilar from I mean, Robert, Robert was talking about, you know, looking at the chart every day, right, or refreshing the chart. Um, and I know a lot of people got in the habit of doing that, um, you know, back in the heyday of 538, they would refresh the 538 model every day, right, and see how it was doing. Um, so I think it's kind of horse racy, right, which for good or bad, um, mostly bad because the day-to-day -to -day totals are not particularly informative. Um, also, hopefully, there's not 
you're not looking and say, aha, now's the time I can go out and get groceries because we only, you know, only five people died yesterday, right? Like, hopefully we're not thinking that, but that, that's the sort of temptation to, to refresh these charts and get new data, even if the new data doesn't tell us very much individually, it's only an aggregate that get these big pictures. Um, the actual log scale versus not log scale stuff, I share Jessica's skepticism that people are necessarily doing the right thing with these. Um, right, it takes a little bit of time for me to know that a little bit of excess in the curve is the difference between you know, 10 people being dead and 100 people being dead. Like, how do we even internalize those numbers? I'm really worried that we're not doing a good job of that sort of thing in our desire to see these overall patterns. Um, but I also think that people have been pretty focused on trying to spend a lot more ink and words in explaining what these things are. Right. Like, or even explaining why they can't do things like I really enjoyed 538's piece about the complexities of putting together a COVID model. Um, right. That level of here's what we're doing, here's what we're not doing and why I, I think is, is at least a positive sign moving forward. Um, just to, just to uh, break real quick, if, if anyone has any questions for um, Michael, Robert or Jessica or just a general question, feel free to pop them in the chat window or just unmute yourself. Um, uh, we could just uh, continue. Um, so uh, let's see, I mean, do you, uh, so, so we've talked about sort of beat uh, John's uh, graph to death. So um, what, uh, in terms of the future or what the next, let's just say months for the database community, do you think there are going to be uh, big changes in how the data viz, let's say the research community reacts to where we are right now. I mean, we, Michael and I were just talking about, you know, Kai conference and we've got IEEE coming up in the fall. Um, but in terms of, of the types of research that people do, um, how is this going to affect, it's going to be hard to get people in a lab, right, <laughs> um, to actually do something. How is this going to affect how people actually conduct data viz research? And maybe you haven't thought about that yet. I'm just, and, and it's not something that I do. So I'm, it's really just me being curious. I mean, for me personally, most of my, if I do experiments, they're online. So on some way, I'm not that affected in how I do research. But I mean, I've been trying to argue for the importance of uncertainty communication for a while. And I'm personally hoping that this COVID, just the whole, you know, data visualization and uncertainty being front and center will will get more visualization researchers to be thinking about uncertainty communication and trying to embrace this aspect, which is not necessarily even visual of how do we communicate, you know, uncertainties that we can't quantify. So when we have visualized results, um, how do we also communicate everything that's missing from our model or just our lack of knowledge about, you know, how important these things that are, are missing are. Um, how does, how does, for instance, like a text communication about that kind of uncertainty along with a visualization of model results, um, how does that affect what a reader does? Because I think we, um, you know, for one, uncertainty visualization is, um, you know, not, I don't think, a, a big enough topic in visualization research, but now I, I'm convinced, um, which I was already kind of thinking about, but now I'm even more convinced that we also need to be really um, looking at, you know, how does this sort of more epistemic uncertainty um, or, you know, just uncertainties that we can't quantify. Um, you know, how do, how do we communicate that with visualized data? Um, because nobody, I think very, very few people are looking at that. And when I look at the COVID graphics, that's, that's all I see is kind of um, this lack of, of certain types of uncertainty communication. Yeah. And also, I think the point of sort of going beyond the data. So RJ earlier, and I know he's, he wants to, to jump in here too. So RJ said diagram is the word that we're talking about here and we're talking about the flattening the curve kind of thing. And so we don't really know much about how you combine data and non-data or how, you, how people respond to the simulitis kind of thing. Um, so Jessica has done a little bit of work on like drawing your own graph. And so that's, that's obviously the first hint that this is actually a very effective way of doing things. Um, but what else can we do that's especially in the face of such, not just like some uncertainty, but like massive uncertainty and can, can, and are there ways that are actually better? Where, what are the, the ways to decide what it should be a picture versus 
a, a picture of data, I guess, versus a diagram and a sketch that's very clearly a sketch versus text and, and just leave it there. Um, and, and what are the pros and cons? And, and, and you can always find design guidelines for that, but I don't think there's any research really on that. Yeah, my, my, my hope is still like, be, okay, the impact is gonna be, there's gonna be a pragmatic one, you know, collaborations that we rely on, especially in academia to get things done aren't gonna happen. Conferences are gonna be more difficult. Um, but I, I, I'm still sort of hoping that it makes people pause and, you know, realize that building visualizations and doing visualization research is not, you know, puzzle solving, right? It's not academic low stakes. Ooh, I'm really interested about what people, you know, there, there are real practical impacts on these things. So I actually kind of hope that it makes people reconsider doing some charts, right? Or at least sharing some charts, it makes people slow down. Um, I know uh, Chris, Chris Collins and one of his students, I think had this, um, this notion of just like there's a slow foods movement, maybe we need a slow analytics movement um, where we just need to take a little bit of time. It's not about getting right. the answer the fastest. It's about really doing the hard work to figure out who are we trying to help? What's the message we're trying to do? What are the, what are the costs and benefits of getting things wrong? So hopefully yeah. humility, pause, reflection, but um, it hasn't been necessarily a good bet to bet on humility, pause, and reflection in the tech industry. <laughs> I think that's, um, I like that idea. I was just going to say, um, one of the things that I think has been most obvious here is that like, and I feel it myself, like when things are super, super uncertain, it's like people, some people at least, like really want answers quickly. And so I think like when we have this kind of case where it's like, we feel like our actual lives are threatened, like that, that impulse can be so strong among viewers that, that like we need the, the sort of slow approach more than ever, just like this this kind of editing is so necessary, but we don't really teach that. I mean, we teach people how to critique data visualizations, et cetera, but I don't think we, at least not in the classes I teach, we don't often grapple with just like, when should you not visualize it? I think like as researchers, at least like our whole like careers are based on like, of course we're gonna visualize data we have. And so I think like beginning to think about how do we, how do we teach that, um, that we should just pause and be slow is a really interesting idea. Um, there are two questions in the box. So I was gonna let RJ go and then Doug, you can go, you can go next. So RJ, it's all you. You have to wait, RJ, you have to unmute yourself or I have to unmute you. Hold on. There we go. Da, da, da. There you go. Hello. Hello. Hey. Um, so a question related to uncertainty visualization uh, is topics that contribute to uncertainty. So I'm thinking of data lag uh, data completeness. Um, is there any sort of structured way of understanding these related topics? I mean, in the visualization research community, we've done a lot of sort of taxonomizing of different sources of uncertainty. Um, what do you mean when you say understanding these, like, like relating them um, or... Un Understand. So I, right now I am uh, in a situation where I am doing very, very fast visualization with very, very crappy data and it's very, very high stakes. Um, and uh, I need to tell my audience who are, who is intelligent, but data illiterate um, that there is a data lag that the reason why the numbers across the last three days are lower than everything else is not because the numbers are going down. It's because that data hasn't hit our system yet. And the way that I'm, and, and et cetera. And so the way I'm doing that right now is by heavily annotating everything. Uh, the problem with heavily annotating everything is that it's, um, it's m even more manual than whatever, than, than what is already an incredibly manual process. So ideally there's like some sort of, geometric, right, um, visual way of presenting um, this sort of message so that you don't have to read anything, you can just feel it, you know, by the look. And especially, and this is one of the strengths of, I think, John Byrne Murdoch's approach is that the, what I'm, the reports I'm making are being seen every single day. And so, uh, and so there's an opportunity to teach people right over time and like you don't teach people the, with annotations you teach people with with shapes and colors and you know fuzzy or not fuzzy yeah interesting i mean i've seen one or two graphics i think um that have shown like 
you have multiple time series um, and you're seeing sort of like bars for things like deaths or whatever, or bars actually for just things like confirmed cases. But then I think the author had also added some bars for like the actual, um, like the true, you know, predicted number of cases so that you could really get the sense of like, these indicators are lagging. I wonder if you could, um, I wonder if it would be worth taking time to make some sort of explainer type thing that you could then, you know, put with all of your charts that that shows even hypothetically, like, here's, here's what the actual phenomena, here's what we think, or here's one, you know, possible way that the actual phenomena might be might be playing out. And here's what we would see. So it's, you'd have to probably think a little bit about the, the model for producing that, but um, something like that, I, I would think, like, would actually make it visual. I agree with you that you, you probably, like, just text annotations won't convey it as well as a visual. Um, but I would probably shoot for a sort of more of a hypothetical visual. Um, I think I can try to find the post. Um, no, no I, I already see it in my head. Thank you. Well, and there, there's also things like sketchiness, where people have tried to draw sort of sketchy lines. I haven't seen this in this context, you can draw dotted lines, which is what the New York Times is doing right now, which is saying, well, this is the current day, we don't have total numbers yet, but it still points somewhere. So you might be looking at that and say, well, oh, it's pointing this way though, it's dotted still. Uh, you could draw sort of an uncertainty band. Even I think if that's just sort of more conceptual than real, I mean, based on real sort of estimates of uncertainty, you that would probably still help to say, we don't really know, it could be going up or down or whatever. So that, that those might be ways of doing that. Maybe I'll, I'll try and share something here real quick because I, I really like this, um, this piece. If I can figure out how to, where's Chrome? Oh, there we go. I'm gonna try and share my Chrome window here. So this is an ancient chart from, uh, this is done by, by uh, Amanda Cox for the New York Times. And um, I can't seem to zoom in now, but this is, and this is done in Flash, so you have to like dig up some old technology, like actually well in Chrome you can write. Anyway, so the, the idea here is that this was looking at the recession uh, around, uh, well, the, the, I guess the, the, the beginning recession in 2009. And the way this works is that she basically looks at this, this chart and um, I mean of, uh, at, this, at this single line of some indicator of, of a production, I think industrial production, and turns it into two dimensions by looking at the, the current value. So this is amount compared with the trend and the amount of change. And so what this does is it turns this one dimension. And so you actually at the bottom here, you can see that this is a single time series, but it turns into this two dimensional thing where you can see different parts, the different quadrants of this chart, basically representing parts of that boom and bust cycle. So that's expansion, slowdown, downturn and recovery. And, uh, and I, I, I keep wondering how to make this for, for the current COVID data, because there is a sort of like the initial outbreak, then there's kind of the steep part and there's the flattening. And then there's the sort of the going back to, to sort of normal. And I, I've tried doing this, but I haven't been very successful. But then also what this does as well is to look at a le leading indicator. So there is some, some indicator here that's an orange and that's going to, be leading the, the blue line and you will see how the blue line chases that orange line, kind of how much you can actually see that. But if you could see, if you could like do that and say, so the current data points this way, but that's, that's sort of our projection. And then here's our actual data. Then you could give some sense of uncertainty, but also some sense of where things are going. If you have sort of estimates um, that, that, that say, well, it looks like we're going this way, but the current data we have is down here and it may be going this way, but it might also just still be sort of like doing something else. So I thought this was a really smart way of showing that data. And that's the kind of thing that, that really would be interesting to see done with the uh, COVID data as well. Yeah, it's somewhat I, interesting. Uh, I was just gonna, sorry, Michael, I was just gonna say it is somewhat interesting. I haven't seen a ton of, of visualizations using animation uh, hmm. with COVID data, which seems we have daily data coming out from countries and subnational data and I haven't seen a lot of of that uh, but anyway sorry Michael I interrupted you go ahead yeah so there's actually a, a couple animated ones that are that are interesting um, I know the New York Times actually uh, partly I think in response to Elijah Meeks yelling at them on Twitter hard to say 
um, has have started doing these animated spike charts that show uh, case changes over time. I can try to find um, that article. But I, I thought this this notion of of uncertainty in time series and lead and lag is very interesting because I've started seeing um, a backlash against the IHME projections. I don't know if you all have seen those, but to me, they're an example of doing everything right in terms of what we sort of assume about uncertainty visualization, right? They have little dash lines to show where they're projecting data. They have big confidence bands. Um, they adapt the model when, as new data comes in, right? Everything, you know, sort of virtuous that you would expect them to do. Uh, and you're starting to see a backlash because for almost precisely those reasons. Um, so for instance, the model changes very abruptly from day to day as stuff happens. Um, in particular, once the number of cases is starts, sort of once we start going up the hump of that curve, you, the uncertainty really decreases a lot. And so there were big changes in those models that weren't, that weren't visualized, right? You don't see how the model has changed over time. You just see how the data has changed over time and then projections are the next. So you're getting people's like saying, should we trust this data? You know, if you look at it historically, you know, was it 70% of the time the data hasn't even been within the confidence intervals, you know, how do people are making decisions on these models, what do we do or not? Um, so that shows, I think we're kind of in a no win scenario for a lot of these uncertainty things, because if we get it, if we get it wrong, then we're misleading people. Um, but it, because the data is so uncertain, we're very unlikely to get it right the first time. And every time we have to shift our expectations or shift the one or two bits of information, should I do this or not? Um, every time we shift those big bits in the decision boundary, uh, then trust in the model goes down. Um, so I, I think we need to find ways of being extremely non-dogmatic in the message that we want people to take away from the uncertainty information, as mm -hmm. we, beyond just telling them that the uncertainty is there. Right. right. I think like one thing I haven't seen much of, but which could be done to convey a little bit of this like hard to quantify uncertainty would be showing the results of multiple models. Um, so that people actually realize like this has a big effect. Um, the most I've seen are simulations where you can change like initial conditions or the values of different parameters and see how big an effect these small changes in your model's parameters are, um, how big the effect is on the results. But I haven't seen as much of actually like, maybe here's our model last week. And if we were still pushing this new data into it, here's what it would have said. And now we're showing you something different so that people maybe recognize like, oh yeah, there are some major parts of the machinery changing. Um, let's see, uh, there was a question, I have to go back. Uh, Doug, you had a question about how researchers study how people understand and act on uncertainty. I don't know if you wanna, I just kind of read that question, but I don't know if you wanted to elaborate at all. No, I did, um, and I think, um, the, the thing I was trying to get at is that what we put on um, our visualizations is sometimes interpreted by people incorrectly. And the classic example is um, the hurricane cone of uncertainties where people see the cones and they think that's the size of the um, hurricane as opposed to um, it's actually you know, made up of multiple models that are showing the uncertainty. And so I guess I was curious how um, researchers actually understand when they create a visualization, how users interpret those, because it may be different than the way the uh, visualization expert intended. And then how do they act on it? I've seen a lot of things where people will see uncertainty and uncertainty bands and things like that. And it gives them a feeling that there's uncertainty, but they always seem to go with what the line shows. Um, right. How do they act? And so I'm curious about how research addresses these issues. Yeah, um, you could look at my lab or Michael's research. I mean, we both thought about this a lot. We actually have a paper together where we looked at all of the ways that researchers evaluate uncertainty visualizations, where I think on some level it's, you know, we know that people tend to rely on heuristics. So what you mentioned where people ignore maybe the uncertainty bands, um, and they just rely on a point estimate anyway. Like there's a lot of literature and judgment and decision-making that, that tells us about these heuristics and how prevalent they are because um, they simplify our decisions. It's much easier um, when we don't have to, you know, perfectly reason about all the uncertainties and we can just kind of make these snap decisions. Um, a lot of that literature is just now, I think, um, starting to influence how visualization researchers think about, you know, how to evaluate designs. Um, I mean, I would say like my lab, um, 
and you know some of Michael's work, we're trying to be um, a little bit more sophisticated in how we evaluate um, whether an uncertainty visualization in particular works. Because I think one of the risks is that often if people have developed these sort of mental shortcuts, like where I'm going to you know ignore the the error bars and I'm going to make a decision based on how big the difference in the means is, for instance, um, between two groups. Um, often those types of decisions can look as though they're correct. And so we have to really, I think, like test things. Like when we have a visualization um, and we're trying to show distributional information, I think we really have to be careful, one, to test a lot of scenarios um, where sometimes, you know, I think it can be good to sort of think about like, what do I think the user might do like in the sort of lazy case? And then how do I, how do I test whether people do that um, in, across many cases, um, because I think sometimes to catch these biases, um, you have to really be sort of um, anticipating what people might be doing. Uh, so I think there's, there's starting to be some precedent for that in the visualization research literature. Um, like we have been using a lot of approaches from like behavioral econ, where we're trying to actually measure like how good are people's decisions relative to sort of like you know, a rational standard. Um, we've also been looking at like how, how well do people appear to update their beliefs from a visualization? So rather than just like, can they read the data when I ask them? Um, we're trying to look at things like, given what you believed about this parameter before, now we're showing you a visualization and how have you changed your beliefs um, relative again to like a Bayesian standard or rational standard. I think there are these ways to start looking at these things. Um, I think in a practice, a lot of visualization designers probably don't have the time or resources to do this. Um, so I think like my best advice would be um, if you don't have access to like focus groups, et cetera, um, at least trying to think about like, what are the, what might a user do who's trying to ignore uncertainty? Cause I think we, there's a lot of evidence that people often will try to just ignore it and make a judgment based on something simpler. So sort of asking yourself, how might my graph you know, allow them to make judgments where they're not even actually looking at the uncertainty and trying to, to sort of guard against that in any way in your design um, could be useful. But I think it's, it's something we just have to be really careful about. And we're just now developing better measures in visualization research for it. Yeah, I, I, I think that's sort of an important, yeah, so the answer to the general question is of how, uh, how researchers study it. I don't know, I mostly, I look at what Jessica does and then do that. Um, but I, it is it is important that we have in visualization a lot of our evaluation is just based on time and error rate. Oh, you know they they were able to get the number off of this bar chart with this amount of error in this many seconds. And for uncertainty tasks, that just does not cut it, uh, especially when there's ultimately a decision down the line. Um, so you really it's the easy things that are very easy to measure are often what's not very important in, in uncertainty visualization tasks. Right, yeah, and I think we talk about this in this paper we have, there's like this gap between sort of what you perceive and what you do with that information. And I think keeping in mind that gap is important because if you if you only think it's about perception, you'll, you'll ask people, you know, can you read this? And often people can read information, but that doesn't mean that they actually use like the uncertainty. So um, just keeping in mind, yeah, like the, what is the decision outcome and how might people try to ignore uncertainty to make that decision? Um, I don't see any other questions. I want to ask one other, one other question, though. Um, given this discussion about sort of this general theme of being careful with the data and understanding the data and then being careful how you communicate it, I'm curious as to your perspective on some of the social data viz projects like Tidy Tuesday and Makeover Monday and I don't know, Webby Wednesday, and I'm sure there's a Thursday one too. Um, you know, a lot of the data that's used for those are, you know, things about sports and things about, you know, some terrible 3D pie chart that someone created. Um, and maybe they don't have the life and death implication that misunderstanding social distancing and COVID would, but I'm just curious, if you have thoughts on how people should approach those various projects when they are putting things out in the world that can be misinterpreted. And is it, and is it, maybe it's just okay because it's, it is a data visualization playground and that's its intention and that's what people are, are using it for. Um, and if someone grabs a graph out of that and misinterprets that, you know, I'm not sure whose fault it is because you're sort of in this little sandbox of playing with, with different forms. But I'm just curious if it extends to these other projects. Yeah, so I think there is a big distinction between 
practicing data viz and assuming certainly in that context that your data is at least good enough to do that and then sort of asking all those existential questions whether we should do this at all or not uh, and of course doing this with very high stakes like the, there have been several calls like michael has has written one and amanda maculek did this to say you know guys at least talk to the experts first don't just throw out your visualizations into the world because you're probably getting it wrong and you're probably doing more harm than you than, than good and, and probably more harm than you think because visualizations are so concrete and so Im impressive <laughs> when you when you see the data visualized it's just different than if you just see some numbers but but these these efforts of just saying well here's some data and whether it's sort of important or not like i don't care about sports so whatever sports data I don't care, but I'm assuming that all the sports data is pretty good because the, there are some sports nerds sitting there like counting all the innings or whatever people do. And, and that's, that's, that's pretty good data. So, and, and actually very good data in many cases. So you can, you can just then say, well, let's not care about or let's not worry about the data quality. Let's just see what can we do with that visually and what's, what are the different things you know, the trade-offs between showing it this way and that way, and do we need summaries and this and that, and do we need to drill down? And that's that's perfectly valid, and that's that's a useful thing to do. But, but that has to be communicated, and I think it has to be clear that the assumption has is that the data is good, and the data is at least good enough to do that. But here, I think we're dealing with data that is so much worse than what most people usually encounter, that these questions are just much more important. So that's, that's just, uh, it's just, uh, comparing very different scenarios where most of the time the data just isn't nearly this bad and and then it's it's just much less of an issue that's not to say that we shouldn't be doing uh we shouldn't be visualizing the uncertainty of course we should but but it's it's a much bigger issue when when you know when you can reasonably assume that the data is just, just much much worse than what you would usually see Maybe people could spend more time visualizing some of the other information that like would help us understand this bigger picture, like the economics of it. Um, one of the things I feel like we've seen so much of are the health outcomes being modeled, but you know, there's obviously this bigger picture of what's going to happen with this recession, et cetera. And yeah. you know, there's going to still be a lot of uncertainty there, but, um, but maybe, you know, we should be posting little challenges related to some of these other aspects that many visualizers are not even really considering. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, there are, um, there's an effort uh, from Cheryl Phillips at Stanford where they're pulling together um, how schools are providing uh, food and meals to students and their families and they're, you know, they're just building a map, but you have to go district by district and collect all the data. So it, it does take some time. Um, and the, like you said, there's going to be a ton of data that are going to be coming out about unemployment rates, about, you know, supply chains and international investment. All that is, you know, maybe a little bit separate from the direct immediate health implications of, of, of the virus. Right. Um, so we're right almost at the hour. I don't know if any of you have any like last words of wisdom you want to share. Um, if not, it's fine. I don't know if there's anything else like to sum things up or we're good. Um, I would just say like, be honest about what you don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like life that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Great. Okay. Well, thanks to all three of you for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Um, I learned a lot. So I hope other folks did. Um, before we go, just a couple of things. So I noticed and a couple of people sort of sent me a note that it was hard to copy and paste out of the chat window for these links. I will uh, capture all of them and I will put them on the YouTube page um, so that people can just grab them and, and collect them be a little bit easier. Um, we're doing another one of these uh, sessions tomorrow with Michael Brenner from Data for Change based in the UK. Um, the time on that um, has changed. Instead, it was at 11 a.m. Eastern. It's now gonna be at one o'clock Eastern, one at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then on Thursday, Tom Mock will be here to talk about uh, R and uh, hopefully I'll learn some of the new ggplot stuff or something. I don't know, we'll find out. Um, anyway, Michael, Robert, Jessica, thanks so much for doing this. This is a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank thanks you. everybody. Okay, have a good afternoon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you soon. Okay, thanks guys. Bye.